Good afternoon. So, if you remember, so today we will continue our study of piecewise affine maps. Our main theorem is that F piecewise affine. Full branch map then the big measure is invariant and ergodic. Okay? So did you do the exercise to prove that the big measure is invariant? Yes. So we proved last time, I left it as an exercise, okay, to show that Lebesgue measure is invariant. It's quite simple exercise. Today we're going to show that it's ergodic, which would not be difficult, but it's quite subtle, and it's an interesting argument. So first of all, we're going to say something about the combinatorics of piecewise affine maps. So remember that piecewise affine maps piecewise I find full branch maps have the structure where they have a certain number of branches and the key property is that each branch maps to the whole interval in an affine way. It can be a finite number or an countable number of branches. So the lemma let F be a C zero means continuous or respectively C one, C two are fine. piecewise um, sorry, full branch map be a piecewise um, full branch map then there exists and there exists partitions Pn of I mod zero. A family of partitions. So for each n, Pn is a partition of I such that P1 is equal to the original partition. So P1 is this partition here. And for all n greater than or equal to 1, for all partition element omega n in Pn, we have the, the map F n from the interior, restricted to the interior Okay, Fn from the interior of omega n to the interior of I is a homeomorphism respectively C1 or C2 or affine Diffel.
So what is this saying? This is just saying something that actually is very simple. It takes a little while to say it precisely. But the P1 partition here is a partition into intervals of, into subintervals of the interval, such that after one iterate, F1, each interval is mapped onto the whole original interval, right? And then, what does that mean? We've, we've looked at the structure already when we studied the topological structure here. If you look at this interval here, each one of these intervals, then because after one iterate it maps to the whole thing, inside here, you can, there is a subdivision of this interval which maps exactly to the subdivision of the entire interval. Right? So there is a small interval here that maps to the first one, there's another small one that maps to the second one, third one that maps to the third one, and so on. So there's a small copy, because what this map does is it maps this small interval in an affine way to the whole interval. So inside this small interval, there's exactly a small copy of the big partition here, in such a way that each element of this partition P2 is mapped after one iteration to an element of the partition P1, and therefore after two iterations to the whole interval, like this. Okay? And then you can continue, you can repeat the process so that at each level Pn corresponds to pulling back this partition n times, so each element of the partition maps to an element of the previous partition Pn minus 1, and then after any it, it's exactly onto the whole thing in a bijection, as a bijective way, or in fact, as a homeomorphism or C1 diffeomorphism or affine diffeomorphism. Okay? So let me write just very briefly the proof. We can easily write the proof by induction. So by induction for n equals 1, we have that uh, this is true by assumption, true by definition of f, okay, by definition of piecewise full branch, for n equals 1. And now suppose it's true. n minus 1. So let omega n minus 1 belong to Pn minus 1. So there's a, by induction, we suppose there's a partition, Pn minus 1. We take one element and we have this property here that Fn minus 1 from the interior of omega n minus 1 to the interior of I is, uh, let's say, homeomorphism, uh, is, uh, well, okay, whatever it is, right, is, uh, is uh, okay, let's say homeomorphism, or in our case, affine, if we want it to be affine, okay? And so what does this mean? Right? What this says is that you have a map from omega n minus 1 to all of i. This is f n minus 1. Right? And inside i, we have our original partition, p. Okay? So because this maps affinely, or at least homeomorphically, to i, that means that we can subdivide this element in a way that it, the images match up exactly with this partition. That's what I mean when I say that we pull back this partition. Okay, so we have a subdivision here. Okay, that maps exactly onto this partition element. And so, what do you know about each one of these partitions, each one of these elements? So, uh, subdivide. omega n minus 1 into subintervals into 
subintervals which we can call omega n, okay, so that for each omega n subset of n minus 1, f n minus 1 of omega n, so f n minus 1 maps the interval, the interior of omega n to some omega in p, the interior of some omega in p. All, again, I always like the interior just because I've not specified if these intervals are closed or open or half open and so on into the interval of some omega for some omega in P. Yes, this is this we've already looked at that in the previous course. We're just taking smaller and smaller. We're defining the partition using the dynamics. Okay? I'm just doing it again partly for completeness and also to emphasize, remember that we are here as opposed to what we did in the previous course, we we can allow countable partitions here. This is some omega for the original partition, some element of the original partition, right? Because this is the original partition P here. We have omega n minus 1 maps to all of i, so we split omega n minus 1 such that each element maps to an element of the original partition, this original partition. Therefore, what do we know about fn? Where does it map omega n to? To the whole original interval, right? Because after n minus 1 iterates, it maps to one of the original partition elements, and by assumption, the original partition elements get mapped in one iterate to the whole thing. Okay? So this maps to the interior of I. And of course, the regularity is always the same, right? Because we assume that this is a homeomorphism, okay? And therefore, when you restrict it, the restriction of fn minus 1 to a subinterval is also homeomorphism onto this. And then from this, you apply f once more, but f from this interior of this to the whole thing is a homeomorphism, so the composition is a homeomorphism. So this is a homeomorphism. If we're looking at homeomorphism, well, it's affine, a composition of affine maps is affine, composition of C1 maps is C1, and so on. Okay? So we get the right regularity. So this very nice, very clean combinatorial structure is the key to the full branch, to the full branch maps, right? This is a very nice. So all the iterates are themselves full branch maps. This is what we're saying. If f is a piecewise affine full branch map, then all the iterates are also piecewise affine full branch maps on some finer and finer partition because e each one as an iterate maps each small interval to the whole, to everything. Okay? So that is why one of the main reasons why full branch maps have such an easy structure to study. Okay, so we're going to use this now to prove ergodicity. This is going to be a key property. So first, let me prove one more small lemma. So f i to i piecewise affine, piecewise affine full branch, okay, then the supremum 
then uh, the supremum of all omega n in Pn of the size of the length of omega n converges to zero as n tends to infinity. And why is this? Yes, but remember that the intervals decreasing is not enough to show that they decrease to zero, right? The intervals, you can have a sequence of nested intervals decreasing, but not to zero. Remember, we use some additional property. What do we, how did we do this calculation before? The derivative is strictly bigger than one. And so by the mean value theorem, this is less than or equal to lambda to the minus n. Okay, and how do we know the derivative is bigger than one? I did not assume anything about the derivative here. Excuse me? F is full branch are fine. Are fine. That's fine. Exactly. Okay, as long as this partition is not trivial, so there's at least two elements in this partition, then uh, both elements are smaller than the whole interval, and they get mapped in an affine way to the full interval, so you must have the derivative bigger than one. Okay, the more partition elements, the bigger the derivative. So proof, um, since f is, is, Piece wise affine, there exists lambda greater than 1 such that derivative f prime of x is greater than equal to lambda for all x in omega for all omega in p. Right? And so uh, the size of omega n is less than or equal to 1 over lambda n for all n greater than 1, and for all omega in Pn, omega n in Pn. Okay, we have uniform bounds on how they shrink. The Lebesgue measure, you don't like this? Yes, thank you. Absolute value of the derivative. Okay, so now we are ready to prove ergodicity. So proof. So, how do we prove ergodicity? Remember, what do we need to prove? So let A be some subset of I with F minus 1 of A equals A. So how do we prove that it's um, ergodic? What do we need to prove? Zero or one. So how do we prove that it's zero or one? <laughs> well, there's various ways in various situations. Right? One standard way is the following. We need to prove it's zero or one. So let's assume that it's got positive measure and prove that it has that the measure one. Right? That's one way to prove that either it's zero or one, is to show that if you assume the measure is non-zero, then it has to be one, okay? So we'll assume that we have that the Lebesgue measure of A is greater than zero. And now we will prove that the Lebesgue measure is equal to one. Okay, so he 
Here we have our interval, 0, 1. Here we have our partition, P, and all the refinements of our partition. So we assume that A has positive measure. So have you heard of Lebesgue density theorem? So the Lebesgue density theorem theorem is very interesting and quite subtle. And we will not prove it here because it's a theorem from measure theory. We cannot prove it here. But it says the following. If you have a... Um, a set of measure of positive measure, right? Then um, for so if measure of A is positive, then for M almost every X in A we have the following property that if you take the interval x minus epsilon, x plus epsilon, and you look at the measure of A inside this interval, so you don't know where this set is, okay? But you take a set, a point x that belongs to A, right? And then you take a small interval here, okay? And you look at the amount of A that's in inside this interval, and you divide by the size of this interval, which is 2 epsilon. This converges to 1 as epsilon goes to 0. So one way to say this is that almost every point is a Lebesgue density point of the set A. Now what does it mean and why is this a little bit surprising? What it says is that if you look at a very small region around X, then 99% of that region belongs to A. Okay? If the set A is an interval, this is obvious. Okay? If the set A is not an interval, this is not at all obvious. If it's, for example, a Cantor set of positive measure or somehow a more complicated set. Because suppose I take a set, a very strange set, and I say the measure of the set is one half, for example. Then why should it not be that if I look at a very small scale, I always get that the measure of, of that interval of A compared to the complement is also half and half at every scale. What this says is that this is not true. The measure of A might be a half at a certain scale, but if you focus on to a specific point, then either the measure of A, the more you focus, the measure of A either goes to zero or goes to one. For almost every point, it goes to one, and for the complement, for the other points, it goes to zero, the density of the set A in some sense. Okay, so this is one of the basic theorems of measure theory, which I acknowledge, is, I appreciate, is not, is, is really subtle, actually. It's not at all intuitive or obvious. But we will use this in an essential way here, because that's what we have here. Okay, here we have a set of positive measure, and we have the refinements of the partition, so if we take 
almost every point with respect to Lebesgue is always in the interior of these refinements. So by taking a deep enough refinement, it's like taking a sufficiently small neighborhood of the point x. Right? So using the Lebesgue density theorem, so for m almost every x in A, there exists, and, and for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists n sufficiently large such uh, and omega n in Pn, because n sufficiently large means that omega n is sufficiently small, okay, so that the Lebesgue measure of omega n intersection A over the Lebesgue measure of omega n is greater than equal to epsilon. So what we're doing is we're using these partitions to zoom in to very small scale. And when you zoom in to very small scale, most of the measure, sorry, what I meant here actually is 1 minus epsilon. What I want to write here is 1 minus epsilon because I want it to be entirely close to 1. That's what I want. So I'm saying that at a very small scale, I can um, I can focus in and I can get an interval where most of the measure of this interval belongs to A. Or equi and equivalently, in particular, this means that the measure of omega n intersection, the complement of A over the measure of omega n is less than or equal to epsilon. Okay, this is just a complement. Now, what do I know about this little omega n? So, remember that I know that omega n maps to i under fn, and this map is affine, right? So here I know that I have the complement of a inside here, okay? And so what I have is because fn, fn from omega n to i is an affine bijection, then the measure is preserved, and I have that omega n intersection a complement over, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, sometimes I use that, okay, over a measure of omega n is precisely equal to the image of both. So the measure of the image of Fn of omega n intersection A over the measure of Fn intersection of omega n. Um, oh, omega complement. Okay. This, of course, is just the same as the measure of Fn, omega n intersection A complement over the measure of I, which is equal to 1.
And this is by assumption less than or equal to epsilon. Okay? So this is equal to 1. So this is less than or equal to epsilon. And what is this? So So they call that f minus 1 of a equals a by assumption. What's the question? Here, exactly. Here, exactly. That's what we're going to do. So the reason we can do that is because f minus a equals to a, so f minus 1 of ac equals ac, because when a set is backward invariant, so is its complement, and so f minus n of ac equals ac. Okay? And so we have that... Um, F n of omega n intersection AC is equal to F n of omega n intersection F minus n of AC. And now I apply Fn to both sides, right? Fn of omega n is the whole interval. Fn of F minus n of AC is just AC. Okay, so this is just equal to AC. You think about it, it's quite obvious, right? So the fact that F minus AC is invariant under the map means that you have AC here, okay? And some sub -in this is some subinterval of this, but because these maps are finely to this, the part of AC that is here must map exactly to all of AC here because this interval maps exactly to all of I. So the part of this interval that belongs to AC must map to AC because AC maps to AC, a maps to A, okay? So it's just that, the fact that this is invariant, okay? So if you take the image of the part of AC that belongs to omega n, you apply, you iterate it n times, this, is, this maps to all of I, and AC simply maps to AC, okay? And so from this, okay, and so we get that measure of AC is less than equal. Epsilon. F of what? Yes. Uh, you're right. It's f of minus n of AC intersected omega n. Well, so f minus n of f n of A is not this is not equal to A. But if you take the pre-image of AC and then you apply N, you get the set itself. Right? In one direction it works, in the other direction it doesn't. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. What what is the difficulty? Here? Here? This equality here. This equality here. What about the second equality? I didn't understand the, these ratios. Why are these ratios are equal? Yeah. This one. Because Fn is affine. Fn is affine. So under an affine map, all the length is preserved under an affine map. The ratios of lengths are preserved, right? Because if this affine is stretching by a factor 200, all the measures are stretched by a factor 200. So the length of this is, stretched, is increased by a factor 200, but the length of this is also increased by length factor 200. So it is the ratio that is preserved. It's not the numerator and the denominator, of course, they're not preserved. It's only the ratio that is preserved. Because f is affine. And in fact, this is a key point that we will come back to because we want to generalize this theorem with removing the affine assumption. At the moment, we're using the affine assumption in a very important way. So the affine means that the ratios of measures are preserved. So here we have this set here. This is AC intersection omega n, and we have omega n. Okay? Now we map all of this in an affine way to this. So the image of this set in here, the ratio between the size of the image and the of AC of this set and this set are preserved by the affine map. And here this is nothing, right? This is just the fact that Fn of omega n is equal to the whole thing, which is equal to 1 in this case. Okay? So back to this step here, we have, we look at the image of this set, okay, which, we, which is this, because AC is equal to F minus N of AC. And then, what is disturbing you here? You know, maybe maybe it's easier if you if we look this. Let's write, let's write this, the set theoretic definition of this, okay? This is the set of all points Z, such that Z is in Wn, and Fn of Z belongs to AC. This is the definition of this, right? So Z is in Wn, and Fn of Z is in AC. So when you apply Fn, you get AC. So you're saying you need to, it's not clear that this gives all of AC maybe. Um, but that, this depends on this. O omega n is fixed, but this is true for any omega n, of course. So f minus n of a of c, of course, has many components. Inside each omega n, there is a small copy of a c. So this is the way to think about it, okay, is that here you have your interval i. Like you say, here you have all these, all your omega n's, right? And then you have your globally, you have your a c. Okay, which is in this set. And if you take the pre-image of AC, this pre-image has 
some, compo some piece inside each AC. And so it's clear that this AC will map when you map this bijectively onto this, this will map to AC because this is exactly the pre-image of AC under Fn. Okay, so uh, maybe I, it's possible that you know formally, they might be. Uh, maybe that's not exactly the right way to write it when you think of the set theoretic definition. But the meaning is clear, and the fact that it's true is clear. Right, so. Because these are exactly the pre-images of AC inside each element. And you map them back to AC. So you use in a crucial way this property here. And the conclusion is that this lesson epsilon, and the conclusion is that we chose epsilon arbitrarily. Of course, depend, we have that the n and the omega n will depend on epsilon, okay? But the bound on AC does not depend on n or omega n. So for arbitrarily small epsilon, we get this. So this implies that the measure of AC equals zero. And this implies that the measure of A equals 1. And this is what we wanted to prove. So we use two ingredients in the proof, and it's worth spending a couple of minutes thinking about them because we will generalize this proof in the next lecture. So what are the two ingredients? In this very last part, we used this fact to, to allow us just to make this last statement, right? to show that you're, we're estimating AC, and AC has a small component inside omega n, and each of these maps to all of AC. But besides that, that is just part of the way we've chosen the set A and the set AC, what are the two ingredients that we used? So first of all, we use this statement here. This is, this is one ingredient. Yes. Sorry? Exactly. Exactly. This is one ingredient, and this is the second ingredient. Everything else is just, uh, you know, everything else is basically just understanding the sets and mapping. And these are the really the two ingredients. And what I mean by the two ingredients is the two places in which we use the assumptions on the map. What assumption on the map are we using here? What property of the map are we using here? All we're using is a very weak property. We're just using the fact that these will be arbitrarily small. We apply the Lebesgue density theorem, and to apply the Lebesgue density theorem, we need to say that for every epsilon, to, to get this, we need to say that we're in a very small neighborhood of the point x. We're in a very small interval. Okay. So the ingredient we use here is the fact that the size of these is going to zero. Okay. And in the previous lemma, we showed that if f is piecewise affine, then these are going to zero. But as you know, these go to zero under much more general conditions. Right? What are the conditions that imply that omega n goes to zero? 
just if the derivative is bigger than 1. Right? We don't need piecewise affine. So piecewise affine is a very strong tool just to prove that these go to 0, and so we get this. Okay, so I'm, we're not going to do it now, but I'm just mentioning it for the future, for the next lecture, that it is very easy to get this part of the argument without requiring f to be piecewise affine. All we need is to be expanding, right, derivative bigger than 1, and then we immediately get this part. So this is very easy. We can generalize, we can say it's full branch, C1, piecewise expanding. This is more delicate. This equality, we certainly needs piecewise affine. If it's not piecewise affine, the ratio will not be constant, right? Because if it's not piecewise affine, it means even if it's expanding, it might be expanding a little bit more here, a little bit less here. So this ratio between the image of AC and the image of the whole thing does not necessarily stay constant. Okay? So how do we solve this? How could we resolve this? Is the, does the whole proof break down? Or is there something we can do? Do you think? If it's not piecewise, I'm fine. It's not Lebesgue invariant. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. There's no way we can get this equality if it's piecewise affine. If it's not piecewise affine, we will not get the equality. So the question is, do we need the equality? Exactly. All we need is an inequality there. We don't need an equality. Piecewise affine gives us equality, but piecewise affine is very strong. What do we need? We really need here just something like this. And everything else will work, right? Because what we really want to show is that this is less than or equal to epsilon, which is what gives us this. So we don't need an equality here, OK? In fact, we don't even need this. We need some constant. We can add some constant here, OK? As long as this constant is kind of uniform and doesn't depend on n. Okay? And this we will this will be one of our main theorems in the course, will be to precisely to prove this theorem for much more general C1 maps that are uniformly expanding. And we will show this is automatic, and we will study exactly this point here, will be a key point. This is called bounded distortion. And it says that the map is not affine, but is close to affine. Sufficiently, the distortion, distortion means how different the derivative is in one place and the other, is not so bad, and so we still get this inequality. Okay? So this is, uh, we will come back to this. I just wanted to mention this. So, okay, this proves ergodicity. So before we go on to this generalization, uh, again, I want to give a little application to number theory, but uh, maybe this is a very good place just to take a couple of minute breaks, so let's do that. Okay. okay, so there's a very nice application of this ergodicity. To number theory. So, do you know what the base k expansion of a real number is? Remember? Yes? So, um, let x say in 0, 1, k greater than or equal to 2, integer. Okay? Then the base k expansion of x is given by x equals x1 
over k plus x2 over k squared plus x3 over k cubed, okay, where xi belongs to 0, k minus 1. So certainly you know when k equals 10, This is just the decimal expansion of the number, right? So decimal expansion. So sometimes we can just write x equals, say, 0 0.x1, x2, x3, x4, k base k. This is just the sequence that gives the expansion of the number. Okay, so it's the usual decimal expansion, for example, in the case of base 10 and another expansion. As you know, this expansion is essentially unique except for some very special points, right? So in the decimal expansion, you know these points where you finish with 0, 0, 9, 9, and you finish, or in the other case, it's very similar, the same special points. So where have we encountered? In the previous course, we already encountered something similar. Remember? In the context of piecewise affine full branch maps, exactly, when we did the symbolic coding, right? So there's a dynamical way in which we can study these base k expansions, and I will come back to that in a second, right? So, but first of all, without any dynamics, just from this point of view, we say that, so definition, x is called normal in base k if x equals 0 0.x1, x2, x3 base k and 1 over n of the number i from 1 to n such that xi equals j limit n tends to infinity equals 1 over k for all j in 0. So what are the normal numbers in base 10? Let's think about base 10 a second, decimal expansion. What does this definition mean? What, is a, what does the definition say in the case of base 10? What are you measuring here? The frequency of the digits, exactly. Asymptotically in the limit, the frequency of each digit should be 1 over 10 in base 10. Then the number is normal. Do there exist normal numbers? That's right. You can easily construct a normal number 
like that. Do there exist not normal numbers? Like what? Exactly. If you just have one digit, if, if, for example, you have any decimal expansion that never contains the number 5 or that only contains the number 0, there's lots of non-normal numbers. Okay? So what do you think is most likely for the number to be normal or to be not normal? To be abnormal. You think so? Yes. Anyone else think so? No, no, no. I, I <laughs> you know, mathematicians will call normal, they use the word normal to, you don't know if it means normal should mean normal or abnormal. <laughs> yes. well, the opposite should be true. The opposite what? There's more abnormal numbers. You think it's very, it's a very strong condition. You think it's a very strong condition. Only very few numbers will satisfy this. You think the normal numbers are very rare. Why is that? <laughs> because you mean you're, you're saying, well, if you just take a sequence of digits, this frequency could be anything, so what are the chances that it would be exactly one over k? Very few chances. Is this your argument? Anybody else have the same argument? Yes. Yes. Mod one. Yes. 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 So, right. So, if we, we, we use the dynamics, the map kx mod 1, and you're saying that this should sh allow us to show that somehow something com this converges for many numbers, or for few numbers, or for all numbers. For many numbers. Okay, we're going to see this in a second. Okay, you have a long, very good lines. Okay, let's see in a second. Let me first, we, there will be a dynamic, we will discuss this from a dynamical system point of view. This is the interesting thing. So I'm formulating the question just from the point of view of numbers and number theory, but indeed the answer will come from dynamics, theory and dynamics. First of all, let me just ask one more question just to, to, to ask you the questions. If a number is normal in base 10, do you think that it would be normal in base 9 or in some other base? You think it would be normal in base 2? What, if it's normal in base 10, then it's normal in base 2? So what we're going to prove is the following theorem. There exists a set n, n in 0, 1 with the Lebesgue measure of n equals 1, such that x in n implies x is normal in every base k greater than equal to. No. A 
although, I, as you shall see, even though the, it's very surprising that n does not depend on uh, k, that's actually the easy part of the proof. We will see. Okay, in a second. So let me remark, however, that as far as I know, nobody knows any such number. So I don't think that anybody knows one number that I can tell you this number is normal in every base. Okay? So this is an abstract theorem. And probably any number you choose will not belong to this set. Any explicit number you choose. Choose the number one half or any rational number or choose the number pi or whatever number, probably it will not belong to this set. I don't think anyone has tried. Uh, recently, I think I saw some, some paper in which someone was discussing this, trying to find some construction to find some number, but it's not. Um... It's not known, okay? However, I, I think it's good that we had a little discussion about it because indeed this is quite a strong property, this convergence here. Okay, so let's see how we will prove it using the dynamical tools that we have so far. So first of all, as you remarked, it's remarkable that this set is independent of K, but uh, remember that if, so it is enough, uh, if we can show, so it is enough, it is sufficient, show that for all k greater than or equal to 2, there exists n k with measure of n k equals 1, okay, such that x in n k uh, implies x normal in base k. So why is it enough to show this? It's enough to show that for every k, almost every point is normal in base k. We don't need nk to be closed because if you take the intersection of all these nk's, all we need to show is that this intersection still has measure 1. And how do we know that the intersection has measure 1? No, 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 no. You don't need no. This is you don't need any of that. With measure, it's much more simple. The complement has measure zero, and the complement of the intersection will be the union of all the complements. And the union of the complements of sets of measure zero has measure zero. Okay, so we write that down. Indeed. Um, um, the measure. Lebesgue measure of the interval minus n the, of the interval um, minus the union, uh, sorry, interval minus n. So let, let n, n equals the union, uh, sorry, the intersection of all the n k k equals 2 to infinity. So this is the set that we're looking for. We want to show that n has measure 1. So i minus n is just equal to the Lebesgue measure of the union. So the measure of the complement is just the measure of the union from k equals 2 to infinity of the complement of nk. I right? to take the unions of all the complements and then you have the complements of the intersection. And this is just less than or equal to the sum, k equals 2 to infinity, of the measure of i minus nk, and this is just equal to 0. Okay, so this is the easy part.
So we just need to show one and k, okay? So let k greater than or equal to two. Let f zero one to zero one be f of x equals kx mod one, okay? Like you said, and then if you remember, what is the structure here? So this is the case k equals 3, for example. If you remember, we have three intervals, i0, i1, i2. So let ij equals the interval j over k, j plus 1 over k. Are these intervals here? Then you take some point here, x, then let x equals 0, x1, x2, x3, and so on, is the base k expansion of x. Then, where is this point? Where does this point Exactly, exactly. So x belongs to ij if and only if x1 equals j. Right? And fi of x belongs to ij if and only if So f of x belongs to ij or a different ij. We can call it, okay, it's still ij for any j, right? So what is the property? f of x belongs to ij if and only if x i plus 1 equals j. Which means that the frequency of digits of j in this expansion is exactly the frequency of how many times the orbit of x belongs to ij. Every time the orbit of x belongs to ij, so you choose, for example, 2, i2, every time the orbit of x belongs here, it corresponds to the fact that there's a 2 in the base 3 expansion. So the limit that we're looking for, the asymptotic frequency of j inside here, is exactly in the limit, the asymptotic frequency of the visits to ij. And what is this limit? What is the frequency of the visits to this interval ij? 1 over k. Why is it 1 over k? Because Lebesgue measures invariant and ergodic. And by Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, the frequency of the visit, by the corollary, remember to Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, the frequency of visit converges exactly to the measure of that set. For almost every point, exactly. So there is, this is true, so the frequency of j's will converge to 1 over k for almost every point, for the big almost every point, which is exactly our statement, which is what we want to prove. Okay, so frequency of the digit 
J equals frequency of visits frequency of visits of the orbit of X to IJ. And this converges to 1 over k for almost every x and all j. And this completes the proof. So there's a lot of connections. This is a result in number theory, but the proof is ergodic theory. And in fact, there's quite a lot of, even recently, there's been a lot of research in ergodic theory methods in number theory to prove certain things in number theory. And this is just one example that I wanted to show you. OK, so next time we are going to remove the piecewise affine assumption, and we're going to study full branch maps without the piecewise affine assumptions, and we're going to study the ergodicity of Lebesgue measure in those cases. Okay? Thank you.